One year ago, I would not have guessed that there would be a new category of criminal offenses in the United States, but there are. There are pandemic crimes, COVID crimes that are spreading around the country. And well, we're sort of dealing with them now. Many people were charged over the last year, but many courts were closed and a lot of things were just kind of put on hold on hiatus for the lockdowns and so on and so forth. But now we're starting to be able to look back a little bit and say, well, what was all that wreckage? What were all those cops doing showing up at people's businesses and writing citations for not wearing masks or for not socially distancing or for going to a park or a church or spending time with your family, walking your dog, whatever. We all know it. We all live through it. And I am a defense lawyer. I got calls from people saying, hey, the Scottsdale police are at my house right now or they're at my business. They're at my gym. They're at my restaurant. They're at my hair salon. What should we do about this? Well, you know, at the time, the government basically had total control and they were acquiescing to themselves. Anytime that anybody challenged any of these authoritarian sort of, you know, shows of force from law enforcement, uh, the, gov the courts and Congress and everybody just sided with law enforcement. We're in an emergency. They have a lot of leeway, a lot of power to do whatever they want to do. So now we're looking backwards and we're saying, what happened? Because this felt inappropriate. It felt like the government touched us in all the wrong places and we're not happy about it. And I want to show you a, an article from Michael Tracy. Now he's over at Substack, mtracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y dot Substack dot com. I encourage you to go support him and to follow him on Twitter because he does good work. He's also pretty prolific on Clubhouse as well. And he did a deep dive on this. So he went through and found a bunch of documents from Newark, New Jersey, that detailed some of the arrests that were taking place back during a, a very high sort of intensity COVID crime enforcement era. And I want to show you what some of his research looks like because it is insightful. He says, new documents show that police charged thousands of people for petty COVID violations. In March and April of last year, drastic emergency measures were imposed by federal, state, and local government authorities for the stated purpose of curbing COVID. By March 16, 2020, all states had declared a state of emergency. By April 7th, all states except four had imposed a stay-at-home order. Counties and municipalities also decreed their own separate COVID-related orders, as is usual in the U.S., the details vary greatly by jurisdiction. Some measures were far more stringent than others, but in general, a new legal regimen had taken hold across the country in the name of combating what was described as a once-in-a-lifetime public health crisis. Yes, the COVID crimes. Now, just leaving your house, walking your dog, not wearing a mask or not social distancing is enough to charge you with a crime. Kind of a scary thing, but that's the nation we're living in. From the outset, a pressing question and still yet to be adequately answered was how exactly these emergency orders would be enforced on a practical ground on the level, uh, on the ground level. Were police officers being directed to issue summonses and make arrests? If so, what under what authority? The diffuse patchwork of laws in the U.S. made this difficult to ascertain in any kind of comprehensive way. Last April, I went to Delaware after coming across reports on social media that police were pulling over drivers with out-of-state license plates pursuant to the governor's COVID-related emergency order. And I remember this, right? I think this was uh, around New York. They were actually stopping people going in and out, crossing state lines, going, hey, where are you coming from? We don't want you in our state unless you're quarantined for a certain period of time. All right. This is not in the distant future. I mean, I know many of us want to forget about this, but this was happening. It says when I wasn't pulled over myself, I did speak to a number of people who had been seemingly arbitrarily since they were from nearby Maryland and routinely from Delaware. Uh, they were stopped arbitrarily, he says. Even if one believed that certain emergency measures were justified under the circumstances, the potentially perilous implications for civil liberties during the periods were unmistakable. State authorities had been vested with vast new power to surveil and monitor citizens, regulate behavior, punish them for noncompliance, and yet our knowledge of how these authorities were actually deploying their powers was severely limited. Widespread closure of courts further complicated the situation. Right. You have a bunch of cops out there enforcing a bunch of crimes. The courts are closed, so they're not processing any crimes. You've got people that are basically out of work that are now trying to you know, go do something in the world. They are trying to keep their businesses open, their homes, you know, rent and mortgages paid and food on the table for their kids. And the cops are out there rounding people up for, let's see, let's see what they're doing out there. Oh, how about this? Sitting in a park was one of the violations. How about this? Sitting and talking to others. Oh, there's another one. Here are examples of unauthorized or otherwise unlawful acts, which allegedly contributed to, quote, jeopardizing the health, welfare, and safety of the people. 
Police also accused him of uh, sitting on a milk crate, visiting with no legitimate purpose, hanging out, being in the street with the company of another, in the street with the company of others, sitting on a bench smoking, encouraging others to not social distance, standing outside, enjoying the weather, socializing with another, not social distancing, and of course, standing without a mask, which is basically a death penalty type of an offense. These violations are punishable by up to six months in prison and a fine of $1,000. All for that stuff. Sitting in a park, hanging out in a street, sitting on a bench smoking. The stuff that you do in a free country where you're allowed to just get up and go outside of your house. Well, back over here in Delaware, New Jersey, they're arresting people for that stuff. Now, as of on April 26, for example, a woman was charged by police with violating another statute. 2C colon 24-7.1A1 as defined as recklessly engaging in conduct, which creates a substantial risk of bodily injury to another person. All right, well, that sounds pretty bad. What was her violation? It was described by police as did knowingly endanger other citizens by not having a face mask on per government executive order to have one to quell the high rate of COVID-19. So by not having a mask, they charged her with a crime that says she was recklessly engaging in conduct, which creates a substantial risk of bodily injury to another person. Folks, I will tell you this, okay? That type of charge is a commonly seen charge. You see that in Arizona. It's a reckless charge. Reckless comes from the old common law. It's been around for a long time. We know what it means. It's sort of pernicious in our statutes. And it is really for stuff that is reckless, okay? Like creating a substantial risk of bodily injury to another person. It's like, you know, the, the example is like waving a sword around, right? Or you know, spinning a gun, a loaded gun, right? That's reckless. It has a very likelihood of causing substantial risk of bodily injury. They're saying this stuff for a mask. Now, look, if you want to say that the mask is going to prevent somebody from catching COVID and dying, I, I get, I get, okay, I get the argument. They're charging people with this stuff regularly out of New Jersey. And, and these are serious crimes, right? Six months in jail, $1,000 fine. People have to face criminal penalties for this stuff. It's not insignificant when that happens to you, okay? You might be somebody who's sitting there going, well, just put the stinking mask on. This is a big deal, all right? This can really wreck somebody's life. And if you're just sitting there saying, well, they should just put the mask on, I, I, guess, I guess you can be of that position. We have uh, somebody else saying here, or no, this is another part of the article. It says, here is a small sampling of the summonses, summonses issued on one day in April, taken from the police log I obtained, okay? One day. So they're just going around and racking all this up. Refuse to disperse, practice social distancing, violating a shelter in place, failure to abide in a shelter in place, congregating with other people, criminal charges for this garbage, violating executive order for COVID-19, group of people hanging out, violating a stay-at-home ordinance, violating executive order, and the list goes on and on. Violating shelter in place. Look at all these things. People being charged with crimes for this garbage going to a park and stuff. All of the above individuals were charged with obstructing administration of law or other governmental function, a disorderly person's offense. As you can see, a large number of people, but not all of whom are listed as non-whites, were explicitly accused by police of disobeying orders of the governor. On March 30th, a man described as black was charged with congregating without maintaining a distance of six feet and without a destination in violation of the governor's order. Oh, April 27th, another black man failed to obey the governor's order by taking part in non-essential travel and failing to social distance. April 28th, another black man. On May 1, we have a white Hispanic issued a summons for standing in violation of governor's orders. For all of the above violation, police said no warning was given. I spoke with a spokesperson, Phil Murphy, for the post, what she thought of so many people being ensnared by the criminal justice system for the crime of defying the governor. She responded uh, saying throughout the pandemic, local law enforcement has enforced executive orders and issued citations when they deem appropriate as they would with regard to any other state law. Right. So yeah, nothing. So they have no answer, right? It's just, well, they have to enforce the law. Okay. I guess so. What did the Newark police say about it? They said they did issue summonses to individuals they found, nothing more there. Clearly not what happened per the Newark police's own direct... Wait, what? Hello, per this, we did issue summonses to individuals found to be in violations. These were primarily for large gatherings and businesses operating outside of executive orders. Let's see. That's not what happened. 
per the police's own records. A significant number of people were issued summonses for claimed offenses for failure to wear a mask, which is what a black man was cited for on April 17th, being outside of non-essential business. Same, so I already went through all of those. Here are more of the violations. So individual will stop for an enforcement order was observed on, an individual was deserved observed on the corner stopped for violating COVID-19 executive orders drinking a 16 ounce can of steel reserve in public oh no we have somebody was standing in front of commercial property we have somebody congregating with three other people failing to maintain six feet of distance failing to wear proper protective gear so not wearing a mask all of these people just being charged with crimes Six months jail. Man named Richard Brandt is another example. April 27th, he has uh, he had been with his wife going for a walk. Says that we were by ourselves. She had her mask on. I had a mask in my hand. Two cops drove by them in a squad car, stopped specifically to give him the ticket. Brandt said of the main officer. Said, I think he was a newbie. I'm telling him I'm with my wife. I'm not around anybody. Took him a long time to write it up. The new guy was very nervous. He was also perspiring, giving it to me. <laughs> yeah, because he knows what a racket the whole thing is. He's embarrassed by what he has to do. Many of these citizens or citations issued over a year ago are still active cases, according to the New Jersey court system. Others appear were uh, to have been dismissed at the discretion of the prosecutor. Still, even being brought into the system this way can have serious consequences for people. Yeah, there's no no doubt about it. Many people don't understand this. You know, they think that if you're charged with a crime. And the prosecutor just dismisses it later down the road that, oh, no harm, no foul. Is that the case? Well, what about the fact that you were probably arrested and your liberty was seized for a certain period of time and that your night was ruined and that you now have beyond that an active criminal record that's probably on the Internet somewhere? Most of these records are public records. OK, so once you get into the system, you never get out of it because we all know as, as soon as something hits the Internet, it is there forever unfortunately it scares the hell out of me i say a lot of things on this show but it is what it is right so if you're charged with a crime now you get charged the government later dismisses the case against you you still have the the original submission it's still out there somewhere and if you had a mugshot taken there are all these mugshot websites now that will sort of seize your picture and they'll put it up there for all eternity so you know for the governor or for whoever was enforcing these things well just go get them a bunch of citations for their masks they charge them with misdemeanors. These weren't just, you know, minor offenses. They're, they're misdemeanor offenses that very likely could carry consequences for them. We have another example, an Egyptian man who said he received asylum in the U.S., got a COVID-related summons while working at a business. He was under the impression he was permitted as, to work as an essential activity. But police entered, asked for IDs, and hand out, handed out summonses. So we've got some more of those. He's got more examples in his article. I would encourage you to read through that. We have Bob DeGroote. He's a criminal defense lawyer in the city. He shared his opinion, says Newark needs to charge people with this like the chief needs a set of hemorrhoids. Okay, so Bob DeGroote. Bob DeGroote coming in with the spice. That's a, that's a good defense attorney right there. You know that's a good defense attorney. Karen Thompson, senior staff attorney for the ACLU of New Jersey, told me she had just started to obtain similar records for New Jersey. It's a little breathtaking, the scope, she said. Given the huge number of summonses issued, the ambiguity around how they are being handled, Newark Municipal Court is still being conducted over Zoom. There's a risk that these cases get lost in the system, as it happens with these municipal cases. That can backfire on those charged. People get the summonses, and they don't know about them. They're not informed about them. Suddenly it goes from them having a summons to them having a warrant for their arrest, which is also accurate. So, you know, a lot of people who are not familiar with the court system, they, you know, they don't know how, the, how this stuff works. They get a summons. Maybe they think that they're going to get something in the mail. Maybe the summons is their court date notice. And sometimes it is in some different states. You don't get anything in the mail. So in, in Arizona, for example, people will get a ticket and their court date is right there on the ticket. Many times people will just forget about the ticket or they'll forget about the court date and they'll get a letter in the mail later that there's a warrant for their arrest. And they go, well, wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to get a court date notice. I got my ticket, but nobody showed, told me when my court date was. It's on the ticket. 
right? So it's just those little mix-ups. Well, now what happens then? That person, they may not know about it. They may have moved. Their address may not be up to date with the court. Now they're driving around on the street, taking their kids to school. Cop pulls them over. Hey, you know why I stopped you? Yeah, you're going about 10 over. Just wanted to check your license and your registration. Oh, by the way, your license is suspended because you forgot about that old court date. Now guess what happens? Well, it's a class one misdemeanor in Arizona. That's the same as a DUI. It's called driving on a suspended license. You can't do that. They impound your car throw it in there for 30 days and you can get it out early if you reinstate your license, but it's a huge ordeal. Cost a ton of money, it's a big problem. So people just don't recognize how incredibly damaging the criminal justice system can be. So when we just have these politicians, so oh, just go write mask orders or things like that. There, there are a lot, a lot of consequences for people. And these typically are people that can't afford a lawyer, okay? These are people who are out, like we heard, standing on a corner, drinking a steel reserve. What's gonna happen with that guy's case? You think he's going to go hire a powerful criminal defense attorney to go handle this thing for him? No, probably not going to go to court. Going to be another warrant, going to be another sort of, you know, a stacking of fines and fees. And his life is probably going to be a lot more difficult as a result of this. So the question is, why are we doing this? Why are we enforcing this? Why are we spending so much time and effort and resources on uh, imposing these governmental Wastes of time, if I can be so blunt about it. All right. The kicker of all this is later on in May, Newark, like countless places in the U.S., hosted massive protests after the death of Floyd, all of which flatly violated COVID policies, which we all knew, right? COVID will only kill you if you are not at a George Floyd protest. If you're there, you're safe. You're good to go. So that's not medical advice. That's a joke. Ugh, this topic. Here we go. We have more charges violating failures to disperse after the shelter in place order may arrest Barca, even though both officials had just spent months hectoring ordinary citizens for failing to socially distance and for gathering in small crowds. Barca himself was a participant in the protest that violated his own executive order. So the mayor passes the rules saying that you can't go out there and protest. Then the mayor himself goes out there and protest. Meanwhile, all of these other people have been charged with crimes for not social distancing, for being within six feet of each other, for congregating too close, for operating your business, for being at a park. Then the mayor goes out there because for him, it's politically feasible. It's now permissible to go out and do that. The hypocrisy just makes my blood boil, as I'm sure it does yours. Baraka even admitted as much to me at the time. He said, this is a violation, but we're doing it anyway, he said of the protest in Newark last May and elected officials wonder why people get fed up with the manifestly arbitrary nature of these enforcement measures because they are baloney. The discretionary powers granted to state authorities to cur curtail the spread of the virus have yet to be fully documented or interrogated. He says Did these tactics accomplish anything that benefited public health health. I don't know. Does arresting the guy drinking steel reserve on the corner. Did that save lives? These officers. There are other ways to handle this, Governor Ron DeSantis is now unringing this bell a little bit. Over from the Daily Mail, we learned that he, in fact, is going to do the opposite. So while in Newark, they were arresting a bunch of people and charging them with crimes, sounds like maybe some of those arrests were also taking place in Florida, but the governor is going to undo that, going to pardon a bunch of individuals who are facing criminal charges and going to grant them reprieve from any criminal consequences, which is a good thing especially if you are a defense attorney and you're tired of the overcriminalization of everything in this country. Let's take a quick look at this article over from the Daily Mail. Ron DeSantis is going to pardon all Floridians being prosecuted for failing to wear masks or socially distance as he surprises a couple on Fox with the announcement after, after they were arrested for not enforcing COVID rules at their gym. Florida's governor on Wednesday announced live on-air clemency for everyone in his state who's being punished for COVID rules. Ron DeSantis, Republican governor, was on Fox News. He was flanked by two people, Mike and Jillian Carnavale, who are gym owners from Plantation, Florida. They were repeatedly arrested for refusing to enforce a mask mandate. The state itself didn't have a mask mandate, as DeSantis spoke strongly against them throughout the height of the pandemic. But individual counties and municipalities did have them, despite DeSantis weighing in against them. Now, people who are ensnared by the local rules will have their slates wiped clean, DeSantis said. So I was in the firmly keep the gyms open camp throughout the entire pandemic. I 
know that that was not a popular opinion back there in uh, March, April, and May, but I thought it was very important because if you are facing a pandemic that is a health concern, probably a good idea to be healthy. Might be a good idea to exercise, eat well, take your vitamins, not drink too much alcohol and put other toxins and poisons in your body. But we didn't hear much of that over the last year. We heard a lot of other stuff like slapping a piece of fabric on your face. Okay, so now we have the uh, governor who is coming out and helping some people who were running a gym during this time. And we had some of these issues here in Arizona. There was a guy, Tom Hatton here, uh, runs a, a gym called Mountainside Fitness that actually sued the government over this, said it was an equal protection violation. And I agree with him. Why are grocery stores allowed to be open? Why are Walmarts allowed to be open, but a gym cannot be open? Now, people say because people are hyperventilating and they're in close proximity. Same thing happens with grocery stores. People are touching a lot of stuff there too, picking up fruits, picking up the box of cereal and putting, it's the same concept. And if they are going to shut down one business, and not another. They better have some pretty good justification for it. If we're all talking about science, well, did they have any justification for, for closing the gyms down and not the other businesses? Well, no, in my opinion, they didn't. And they didn't present any, certainly, before the government came out and issued their orders. So I was pretty irritated about that. And now we have uh, you know Ron DeSantis, who is dealing with some other gym owners. I'm not a gym owner, but other people who are gym advocates who uh, were, were arrested multiple times for trying to run their business and keep people healthy in the middle of a health pandemic. So here is Ron DeSantis over on Laura Ingram on Fox News last night. All Wait, let me swap this over. And we'll play that again. All outstanding uh, fines and penalties uh, that have been applied against individuals are suspended. Uh, I think we need to get away from trying to penalize people for social distancing and and just work with people constructively yeah so th that sounds very reasonable to me and i you know I, i'd like to see more of this in general I, I just don't i don't understand the idea why our society is so hell-bent on punishing the hell out of people for every single thing that happens you know i like the idea that maybe Maybe our government says, you know, we did something and it wasn't the best idea to do that. So we're just going to get rid of all that. You know, we had to be a little bit aggressive on the front end in order to achieve some policy end, which I disagree with. But I at least understand the justification. Right. At least the explanation is this is just an emergency. And now you come back down later and say, look, we, we had to do what we had to do, but we're not intending on charging you people with these crimes for this. I think what Ron DeSantis did was very reasonable and appropriate. And I'd like to see other governments do that because it was an emergency and a lot of people didn't really know how to you know, navigate the whole situation. And we should be compassionate and empathetic for those people. Mike Carnavali, the gym owner, was first arrested on July 27th for what their supporters in a GoFundMe page said what described was as taking a stand for the health and freedom of his community and his country. He was arrested twice more, August 6th, August 7th, for not enforcing facial coverings during strenuous exercise. Jillian Carnival was also arrested on August 7th. The couple will be granted clemency, DeSantis said, describing the punishment as a total overreach. Same deal will be granted to everyone in his state. Said, I'm glad you have Mike and Jillian on. Uh, I think we have the clip here on the next segment. So let's watch this. Wait. New studio uh, technicality problems. Thanks for the understanding. Here we go. Jillian and Mike join me now, along with their attorney, Corey Strola. Also with us, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who's been following this story very closely. Mike, I want to start with you. You've been arrested three times over the masks. It's hard to believe, isn't it, Laura? No, I just like I can't even believe this. This is the United States of America when I'm hearing this. What happened? So two months after gyms reopened in South Florida, Broward County came down with a mandate set saying that facial coverings had to be worn during strenuous exercise. 24, you know, we filed a lawsuit against Broward County for this. 24 hours after the lawsuit was filed, we were arrested. We were arrested three times in total. They seized our business. They offered us 10 days in jail. We declined that, and now I'm looking at six months in prison. They also arrested Jillian here as well. Jillian, does this seem like the country you grew up in? Definitely, definitely not. It barely feels like America. 
Uh, Corey, uh, what are the prospects here of getting any assistance or help? Well, we really at this point have to rely on Governor DeSantis, and I hate to put it in his lap, in his executive general counsel's lap, but we've got a political activist judge that originally told Mike and Jillian before I was ever retained that the state was offering a diversion program and the judge said he was gonna personally decline it and it was the judge that said the only resolution he would approve is a 10 day jail sentence for Mike in jail and that was before Jillian's case was transferred in. So the way Broward State charged it, Mike is facing actually two second degree misdemeanors for a total of 120 days in jail <laughs> And Jillian is facing one for a total of 60 days in jail. Oh my God. All this... for basically not having people wear masks while exercising. That's oh my God. what we're talking uh, uh, about. Uh, this is insanity. Governor DeSantis, uh, it sounds like Broward is like thumbing their nose at you. You've been very pro reopening, getting rid of these mandates. Uh, what the heck's going on here? And what, what can you do? Well, well, it's a total overreach, Laura. This is exactly what we uh, ordered against last summer, many, many months ago. Uh, and so I was actually just recently briefed on this case uh, and we looked at it. And so I I'm glad you have Mike and Jillian on. And I'm also glad to be on to be able to say that uh, effective tomorrow morning, I'm gonna sign a reprieve under my constitutional authority. Uh, so that'll uh, delay the case for 60 days uh, against both of them. And then when our clemency board meets in the coming weeks, uh, we'll issue uh, pardons, not only for Mike and Jillian, but for any Floridian uh, that may have uh, outstanding infractions for things like mass and social distancing. The fact is, wow. it's not even right to be wearing masks when you're exercising. The World Health Organization advises wow. against it. It's not healthy for people to be doing that in the first place. So it was a bad restriction. Uh, but these things with health should be advisory. They should not be punitive. And so uh, we're happy to use our constitutional authority. I think they've been treated poorly. And uh, fortunately, uh, they got a governor that cares. Uh, wow, how does that feel to the Carnivales? They, you, you just got your reprieve on national television. Thank you so much, Governor DeSantis. We thank you. Appreciate that a lot. Wow, you. Yes. Wow, wow. Okay, yeah. So that's a powerful thing that happened right there, and it, it was interesting because it sounds like what the attorney was talking about was about the, it, the the government was offering this this couple, these two people, a diversion deal, which means that if they would essentially plead guilty. Now I don't know how this works specifically in Florida, but I can give you the framework on how. This typically works in Arizona. A couple ways this works, but I'll give you the one that, that is more common. So in, in a diversion case, what that means is that if you agree to plead guilty and then do something on top of that, they will delete your guilty plea. So the way that this would work practically is you would go into court and you would say, okay, listen, yes, I'm going to plead guilty to violating the governor's executive order that limits COVID gatherings or whatever these two gym goers, whatever they were charged with. They would say, yes, I'm going to plead guilty to that. But if you remember, we've been following along the Derek Chauvin case. That alone is not the end of the case, right? You have a conviction, then you have a sentencing. So you have to first be found guilty or plead guilty first, and then the judge will sentence you after that. Well, what's happening now with Derek Chauvin is he's been convicted, and the judge is going to sentence him, and it's very likely going to be a substantial amount of time in prison. But in a diversion deal, you can plead guilty, but the judge cannot sentence you or they can hold off on sentencing you and give you the opportunity to go and do something. So to remain law abiding or to go take an alcohol class or to go take an anger management class or to go do something in exchange for coming back to the court and providing proof of that. But if you do that, then the court at the sentencing will dismiss the case. So there are some authorities under state law that allow different courts to, to sort of effectuate those deals so that the, the guilty plea will then sort of just be torn up. So what would have had to have happened if that is the same structure in Florida is that the, this couple would have had to have gone into court and said, yep, I plead guilty to this. Yes, I agree. We were in violation of the law. And so obviously they're not going to be able to do that, right? They're not going to go in there and say, all right, like our fault, we're going to plead guilty on this thing. Sorry, we're going to go take these classes and come back. And then we're going to ask 
for you to dismiss the case. And so that, you know, typically can be a pretty good deal. A lot of people may want to take that deal in other situations. Like if you're in a disorderly conduct case, right? You're out in Old Town at a bar, you get into a fight. You're not an activist. You're not taking a stand for anything. You just had too much to drink. So sure, you'll go spend a Saturday morning in an anger management class in exchange for a dismissal. The whole thing goes away. Sounds pretty good. But for these, this couple, for these two people, right? This is a, this is a point. This is an activist m moment. They are standing up for their business, for health, for free freedom in America. And so no way in hell are they going to take a, a, a diversion deal where they have to go in and plead guilty to something. That's not going to happen. And the, the judge, it sounds like, wasn't going to accept that anyways. If, they, if the government was offering that and they weren't going to take it, and the judge was sort of wanted to make a political spectacle out of this, said, well, I'm not going to take that anyways. I'm not taking anything less than 10 days of jail in a plea deal because that's what I think is appropriate. So these people basically were at the end of the line, right? It, 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 I, I'm speculating here, but I would guess if I were their defense attorney that this is how this was going, that they're not taking a plea deal, that the government is not dismissing the case, they can't do that, and that the judge wouldn't be accepting a plea deal that they would take even if they had any inclination to do so. So the only other option would have been a trial. Now the governor just came out. That's not going to happen either. So that whole thing is, uh, was, was, is now going to go away. And it's the right move. We don't want people over overly criminalized for anything in this country. So we're going to wrap up this article over here. It says finally that Florida is among only five states that have fully opened, according to a tally being kept by a government relations firm. Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Georgia all have 100% scores on the firm's tally when it comes to being fully open represent eight other states are also almost along the way they have a 96 percent score we have illinois is the lowest with 45 new york is 52 california is 50. isn't that interesting all the big city big blue states as for clemency florida is the first state in the u.s to issue such a clemency and desantis has positioned himself throughout the pandemic as a pro-trump bulwark against democratic authoritarianism and he's doing a good job of it i mean he's capturing a lot of eyeballs. The number of people affected remains unclear for perspective. Just in Miami-Dade County alone, there were 1,800 citations totaling $760,000. Can you believe that? Another 215 citations totaling $109,000. In Naples, we had 4,000 citations totaling another almost $800,000. So we've got uh, almost $2 million right there just in fines, just in fines. And I've said this, right? And I know it irritates a lot of the pro police audience out there, but serve and protect or tax collect. How much money is that? Run is given a lot of that back because they're not going to collect it. Overall, 52 out of 67 counties and 212 out of more than 400 municipalities responded to the Sentinel's inquiry. Uh, Orange County reported 13 arrests. Florida stood out from other states when it comes to hands-off coronavirus rules and did a pretty good job with it. Since the early days of the coronavirus pandemic, no two states have been more different in their approaches than California and Florida. In early March, California Newsom limited gatherings, closed bars, indoor dining at restaurants, and implemented mask mandates and implored residents to stay at home. Comparatively, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has enacted few measures, lifting an ordinance that prevented people from operating businesses, restaurants, as well as lifting COVID-19 related fines and penalties in September. Despite these different approaches, both states ended up with roughly the same outcome. Oh, so you're telling me that all of those arrests in Newark and, and, and Orlando or in all of these other places that they didn't do much of, of anything or the, I'm sorry, the arrests were happening all over the country, but I'm talking about the mask mandates and the business limitations and the limited gatherings and the indoor dining bans and the list goes on and on. Let's take some questions over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And first one in the house is from Osak. Says, Rob, is this possible that this was about money? Hard for a city to make money like traffic tickets or other city ordinances when no one was out and about. Yeah, I, I think that you're exactly right. Criminal law is big, big money. And I talk about this a lot. So is traffic tickets, traffic tickets and traffic fines. In, in Scottsdale, the last time I looked at the numbers, our photo radar system the, the the cameras that take your pictures all over the place we have a lot of them in scottsdale millions of dollars a year okay i don't remember what the number is now and i don't know what the number is uh it, relative to covid because that that year was bad but the last time i looked at it, it was like six to seven million bucks a year that's, that's not insignificant that is a nice chunk of change we just heard in the previous slide that there were almost two million dollars in fines and fees that were going to be generated 
from some of these COVID restrictions. So they make a ton of money over this stuff. And if nobody's out driving around, if nobody's holding conferences, if nobody's going out to bars and Sixth Street and Old Town and having wedding parties and bachelor parties and coming in for golfing events, well, you're not going to get many DUIs. You're not going to get many disorderly conducts or urinating in publics or criminal trespasses. So how do you make up for the gap in your budget? Well, you go and force all these COVID crimes. Not wearing a mask, not social distancing. We just saw Florida, $2 million. Now, they're not going to collect it because the governor is going to give it all back. But, wow, and would give it back to the people. Shouldn't have taken it in the first place. Ryan is in the House, says, last year when all of these draconian curtailments of constitutionally protected freedoms were taking place, I suspected that once all of the COVID-19 restrictions eventually would be lifted, there would be a massive deluge of lawsuits being filed against local and state governments sweeping the nation. Do you anticipate this happening? If so, when should we expect to start seeing this? So I'm not sure that we're seeing a massive deluge of lawsuits. I mean, I know that it kind of depends what lawsuits you're talking about. I mean, I think that we're going to see a lot of consequences from the COVID era. You know, I think people are sort of of this mindset that, oh, we're over it. You know, that we have uh, the vaccines are out now. Everybody's out and about. A lot of restrictions are being lifted. But we have not paid the bill for that. OK, we basically took a year off. We printed a lot of money, didn't produce much of anything. And we're going to the, the bill's coming due. And we're seeing that in inflation. We're seeing that in the stock markets. And so people who are doing cartwheels because it looks like Biden has delivered us you know, to the promised land, I think are in for a rude awakening when the end of the year comes, unfortunately. Now, as it comes to covid, I'm also not you know, not sure that we're going to see any any lawsuits sort of. A lot of people were afraid, a lot of lawyers were afraid at the, at the outset of COVID that people were going to be suing each other for giving each other COVID, right? So if you're like an employer and an employee gets sick, is your employee going to sue the employer or is, you know, is, is Walgreens going to get sued or is Walmart going to get sued or, you know, for having people who get sick in their stores? In other words, is there going to be a lot of civil liability flying back and forth? And I just haven't seen that. And really, I think that a lot of states are even responding to sort of prevent that sort of COVID protection laws to, to insulate people from any of those, uh, you know, frivolous claims that might be coming down the pike, because it really is a hard thing to prove. Where did you get it and who gave it to you? And what was the cause? And did you contribute to it? Or can you know, how, how do you prove it all? So uh, are we are we seeing those civil lawsuits? I don't know. I don't practice in that space. Maybe we are. Maybe we aren't. So I really couldn't speak to that intelligently. But I think that you know, the, the bill will come due in terms of our financial, our economic situation, and you will see some some constitutional litigation work its way through the courts. And we may not see the outcome of that for several years. Like there are a lot of questions about, you know, freedom of religion and whether or not you can maintain a church and have a congregation and perform a mass when you are in the face of governor lockdowns, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very important question. And those legal questions take a lot of time to work their way through the courts, a lot longer than a year in, in many cases. And so, you know, unless the Supreme Court accelerates anything, we may see that some of these constitutional issues land at the Supreme Court this term or, or next term. But I think there's still a lot to, to sort out. We're just sort of working our way through the wreckage right now. You know, for about a year, our butt was in the fire. And I use this all the time. This is the fire and this is our butt just right in the middle of it. Well, now we're sort of working our way out of it. And some of the, the heat is dissipating as we create some distance there. But now we're looking back and we're saying that was a that was a roaring fire. That was a big, hot flame. What happened there? And we want to make sure that we're doing our investigation to see where, you know, where it came from. And we really want to prevent it again. And I don't just mean the pandemic. I mean, everything right the government overreach all of our response which you know many people are, are, are still debating about you know it, its efficacy a lot of things that we can do to improve ourselves as a, as a society there's a great book by Nassim Taleb it's called anti-fragile and it's this concept that that when you have a, a, a system that is that is let's say robust there, there are these three kinds of, of statuses or there's a status of a system that can be strong or be robust. In other words, it's not going to be knocked off of its game under ordinary circumstances. It's robust, right? Like think of a car that's reliable. It gets you where you're going. That is a strong vehicle. It, it's, it's effective at doing its intended function. That is a robust item. Okay. Same thing. Or, 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 or the opposite concept of this would be 
something that is fragile. You have robust and you have fragile, or you have a robust car, then you have a fragile car, something that breaks down every time you get in it, the ignition doesn't turn on, this tube breaks, this hose falls off, nothing is functioning. So you have something that's robust and you have something that is fragile. Well, you also have a concept that's called anti-fragile. That means when something is sort of facing pressure, when it's facing stimulus, it actually gets stronger. So when you talk about a fragile item and you apply pressure to that, it's going to break. When you apply pressure to a robust item, well, it's not going to break as easily. It's going to be strong. And it's going to be able to withstand the consequences of whatever pressures you're putting upon it. And many people think that that's great. You want to be robust. You, that's, that's exactly what you want to be. And that's true for most situations. But there are uh, there, there's another category. It's called anti-fragile. And it's when there is some harm that comes upon the system or comes upon that thing that you are acting upon, it actually gets stronger. So the analogy that uh, uh, Taleb uses in his book is the airline industry. Okay, The airline industry, every time there's a plane crash, that is a dramatic thing, right? That is an awful thing. We use some lives. But out of that bad environment, out of that bad incident, the entire system of the, of the airline industry gets stronger because we root out the problems. We say, oh, that machine didn't work, that equipment failed, we should have tightened up this procedure, that pilot screwed that up, whatever. And the entire system gets a little bit stronger. So, you know, same concept as we're working our way through this pandemic. We, you know, we wanna make sure that as a society, we are taking a look at some of the old systems and the old things that don't serve us anymore and get rid of those while we are favoring and supporting the things that, that continue to work. And um, governments and, and politicians and governors and, and we're all trying to figure that out moving down the road. Next question comes from DeSantis. I'm sorry, comes from want to know says, did DeSantis actually stay execution of prosecution and recommend that he would send the case to the pardon committee and recommend it gets pardoned? Doesn't the governor have full pardon powers? What does the pardon committee do? Understand the governor gets a lot of requests, but this was done on live TV on the Ingram show. So I don't know about the specifics, but I think on the show, didn't he say that he was going to sign an order tomorrow, which will probably be maybe today or tomorrow. So uh, we'll be able to take a look at what that says a little bit more specifically. But either way, I mean, I think that th those are just details. This is him ultimately making the commitment that these charges are going to go away, which is a good thing. Sharon Quinney says, this was a golden opportunity to get a lot of extra cash from fines and from the government. Yeah, uh, you're right, Sharon. No question about it. Justice First is in the House, says COVID restrictions. You can't legislate social courtesy. Most of these violations would only require the cops read a statement to everyone present about the medical risk and courtesy to others and then leave it at that for adults to make decisions. Sounds it sounds reasonable to me, right? I think that that most people can can think for themselves, but the government doesn't think that they think that you have to be told what to do and you have to abide. Otherwise, if you don't, you have to be arrested and charged with a crime. Jeremy Matridas in the house says, how about governments able to bring criminal charges against people for violating rules dictated by the governor or health department and not by the legislature? At most, wouldn't these be considered misdemeanors? So, uh, yes, that, yes, they, they should be considered misdemeanors, I would imagine. I don't think that anything that we've talked about would amount to a felony violation. You know, felony, the difference between misdemeanors and felonies, felonies, you think about prison, misdemeanors, you think about jail, most low level offenses that don't involve, you know, massive amounts of drugs or serious physical injury or repeat offenses. Most of those are going to be misdemeanors. So I would imagine that that most of, of those would be misdemeanors, if not all of them quite frankly. Liberty or Death says, wow, here I am thinking that Article 4 guaranteed the people a Republican form of government. You know, the whole separation of power is good to know that all it takes is a pandemic with a 1% mortality rate for the Constitution and the rule of law to be suspended and the executive can order the arrest and fines of the citizens for disobeying. That's, that's a great summation of it. And I mean, really, that's kind of what happened. I mean, we, we saw litigation around the country that were in direct response to the COVID regulations and courts all across the the, the entire nation just turned around and said, yep, you're allowed to do that. 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 That's the new reality. We have Baranski's in the house says, Rob, the people that set up Nancy Pelosi's COVID violations also set up all these people. Oh, I see. I see what's happening. Yes. Yes. I understand what you're saying. Yes. 
they did there's a grand conspiracy for covid violations i got it yes you're exactly right we have underscore shade says can citizens do a call to action suit for those untouchables who broke the mask laws look at those violations these mask violators can you believe these people we have ryan in the house says i gained over 20 pounds thanks to the gyms being closed during lockdowns now with the gyms reopened i now go every day have lost half of that still working at it thanks to you and faith joy for giving us all a regular dose of sanity during this rough time well that's awesome news ryan i think that's really great and, and you know i think a lot of people are in your position and a lot of people are working themselves back through it i know that it was a it was a struggle i mean even for myself it's like i I, uh, I went a little bananas when they were closing the gyms. I mean, I went, I drove out, I drove hours to, to assemble all sorts of weightlifting gear because for me, it's, it's more than just about fitness. You know, it's sort of part of my mental routine. We talk about, you know, staying balanced, staying centered, having an existence system to make sure that you are on track, staying motivated in alignment with your mission, your principles, your vision, your values. You know, you're saying your affirmations, all of those things. For me, a gym, the gym is a big part of that. It's also a big part of my sobriety about keeping me focused, about making sure that I show up and, and do well for my business, for my team, for our clients, for my family, for everybody who's important to me in my life. It, it's an integral part of that. And it's important to me. So when they said, oh, you don't get to do that anymore. You just don't. We just decided for you. And I said, I, I know, but I'm I'm young and I'm not a high risk category and I, I have a private relationship with this business. The gym, by the way, agreed. They also wanted to keep open. They were suing the government in order to do that. It's a private company, their private land, their their personnel, their their place of business. They can let anybody in that they want to let in. I'm a private citizen. I could not go and do business with them because the government said so. Right. Regardless of what you say about COVID, you could say you two people are idiots. You two morons. You're going to go in there and work out with a bunch of other morons. Good riddance to all of you. Right. That's fair. That's our decision. We want to get up and do that. And you can say, well, it's got this you know, spillover effect and it's going to hurt other people. And the list goes on and on. And you can you can say that about everything until you're blue in the face. I wanted to go engage in this. They didn't let me do it. I'm still a little bit hot about it but we're back in business now. Now, Ryan, I just want to commend you again on your, on your commitment to getting back in there because a lot of people are not doing that, right? Look around. A lot of people are just sort of writing that year off as a lost year, which I think is sad. We got to get back in business. Let's get after it. All right, Norovirus in the house says, I'm betting on this police motor vehicle stops is what will break the spirit. People will fire police over the fact that they do taxation this way. Yeah, people, people hate the traffic stops. There's no question about that. No question about it. We, we some years ago, maybe a decade ago, we had somebody in Arizona who actually shot one of the photo radar cameras. I mean, like, good, like four or five rounds into that thing. Just like, nah, made everybody feel good. But that was illegal, and I do not condone illegal activity. All right. We are going to be, uh, thank you once again for all of those questions over from watching thewatchers.locals.com. I really appreciate your support. You can find us over there. A lot of good events coming up, a lot of good things that you can download over there, including a copy of my book. So check that out.